Well, thanks again, everyone, for doing this. Really just appreciate it. Okay, I will start to admit uh, our guests. We will be going live at 8 p.m. sharp, and then we can start soon. Adam, we're live. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Adam Hug. I'm the director of the Foreign Policy Centre here in London, and we're delighted to be collaborating with the with Cabar and the other group PR today on um, the first in a series of events, um, trying to build on both of our work on Central Asia. Um, today, we are looking at Central Asian neoconservatism, national identity, civic freedoms, and the challenge of protecting women's and minority rights. Um, this is a theme that has been part of a recent project that two of our speakers have been involved in, uh, in relation to Kyrgyzstan, the Foreign Policy Centre of Treating Rights Project. Um, and I know I've worked with Nazima as well on this situation in Uzbekistan in the past and ongoing. And I know that uh, all the speakers have also worked with Kabar on, on some of these issues over the years. Uh, but it's a really important topic. Um, and you know, it, it brings in complex issues of identity um, and, look, and, and, and um, different sort of social forces in the countries themselves. And across, um, and, but they're also part of, uh, of regional and global trends around the rise of, of populism. Uh, and, and social conservatism. 
um, which are um, interplay in, in really interesting and important ways that are it's essential for us to try and understand better. And I'm delighted to, as I say, have three speakers here who, who know these issues very well. Um, and they are Gulzat Baeva from the University of Tübingen, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Eric McGlinchey from, uh, from George Mason University, and Nazima Devetla from, uh, well, who wears many hats, but including Webster University in Tashkent. Uh, we are going to start um, today's proceedings with uh, with Gulzat, uh, so I'll hand over to you. And but just before Gulzat starts, and I really should have said this at the beginning, um, we are streaming live. This is a public event streaming live on Facebook and uh, and as well as the Zoom today. Uh, if you want to ask a question, we will be doing questions after the three speakers have spoken. Uh, if you can please put your questions in the chat function, I will try and pull them out and ask. Uh, as many as we have time for. It would be helpful if you are able to suggest who might want to answer that particular question that you're raising. Um, but anyway, uh, speakers will not be required to answer all parts of all questions that I raise uh, when we go into the Q&A session. But um, to help kick us off, I will hand, hand over properly to Gilzad. Thank you. So thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you for the organizers here yeah, to invite me for this round table and for the opportunity to talk again on this very important issue. So for our publication of the Foreign Policy Center, um, uh, with my um, colleague, Joel Manalif, I wrote uh, mostly about the, uh, our new president's like, uh, techniques and uh, his uh, coming to the power and uh, about populism. But today, I will talk more about the general cleavages in Kyrgyzstan and the role of social media in polarizing people. So uh, yeah, undoubtedly there is a growing influence of uh, conservatively minded groups in, uh, in the country. So, and conservatism or neoconservatism in the context of Kyrgyz society, it includes uh, new Islamist or, or traditionalist revivalist groups. And it's an indeed the interplay of religious and national identity in the country. So Islamists, uh, I would say they're those whose values are based on religion and translocal forms of Islam. So especially influenced by the Tablighi Jamaat and the other transnational Islamic movement. So and traditionalists or like uh, so-called South Chula in Kyrgyz uh, are groups uh, whose values based on like uh, pure Kyrgyz traditions, um, lifestyle, uh, so revival of uh, traditional games, spreading ideas and cultural codes from the epic manas. Uh, so conservatism in general is developed both uh, on the top down and on the bottom up or grassroots levels. And uh, it is the government who embrace traditionalization for the sake of nation building. It's grassroots Islamic movements. Uh, so who search uh, for unifying religious identity. Uh, there are some groups in between or or even like pro-government um, uh, protest or def defenders like ultranationalist Khachoro uh, movement. Uh, so, and there are also like self-declared defenders on uh, Kyrgyz purity or self-appointed experts on traditions or on Islam or on both. Uh, some other self-promoted influential figures, bloggers whose content is provocative, so proclaiming conservative religious ideals and uh, discriminating other groups. So as you see, the conservative uh, non-state and state actors are not homogeneous. So they are different players so, and uh, they share the space more or less peacefully and they have more or less similar agenda. So, so they have uh, challenges or threats in the face of liberal or democratic forces and like changing gender norms. So now, although there's a slight identity war even within these groups, it seems uh, this um, intensifies uh, more with the new regime. So what I, I, I observe these days from social media research and my participation in the expert talks with the pro-government and traditional organizations, uh, there's a conflict boiling within the conservative groups. So on the one side are traditionalists supported by the president's office. So on the other are religious groups, so leaders of uh, like Islamic civil society, let's say. So they confront each other. Um, now it's not that obvious. Uh, so, uh, and the, it's not only for the economic and political control, but also like in case of traditionals, it's uh, like confrontation for the right to build nationhood and like pure Kyrgyz identity, which is free from foreign influences, including Islamization. Uh, so the new project of the constitution and the first 
uh, decree on vague concepts of uh, moral, spiritual values, like uh, in Russian, uh, it's so this kind of uh, very stretchy notions signed by the president so indicates the inclination uh, towards an unclear nationalist move. Uh, so and during our close debates, the leaders of uh, these traditional organizations uh, who developed the text of the decree, so they argued and they sounded optimistic and um, they uh, stated that this law is urgent, it's unique, and it is um, uh, set out to purify traditions so, uh, and Kyrgyz nation of foreign influences. So th this is yet to come and yet to impact the society further. We will see this. Uh, but uh, this, um, in general, such an, um, uh, like uh, conservatism, in, increasing uh, conservative like, uh, movement of turn, so has been causing societal polarization and it is becoming an important issue. So uh, recent political events in Kyrgyzstan so it, uh, intensified the divides across various segments and it revealed uh, growing cleavages within uh, Kyrgyz society. Uh, the, they, so these events, they demonstrate the absence of a constructive dialogue which could bridge different social groups. So, and role of social media is surely very strong in the emergence and transformation of norms and values. So, and online platforms and digital technologies significantly contribute to the modes of interactions and relationships. So, uh, and just to mention, uh, those uh, who is not aware of the um, dynamics of uh, social media in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so Russians, uh, there's a divide, like a language-based divide. There's a Russian-speaking social uh, media users and Kyrgyz-speaking uh, social media users, they exist like, uh, let's say, in parallel worlds. So if uh, Russian social media uh, in Kyrgyzstan is generally oriented towards middle class and urban residents, so Kyrgyz social media is normally popular among residents in regions and uh, rural areas. So this created like echo chambers and therefore like reflections, reactions, values, perceptions of the groups are trapped so in this uh, squeeze box. Uh, so people in rural areas, uh, they tended to trust the content in newspapers. So not surprisingly, when the news circulated in social media came to replace this traditional newspaper. So people readily took for granted the reliability of the online content. So it is spread through trusted networks. So regardless of the type of news, uh, be it real or fake. So what salient trend on Kyrgyz social media appears to be personal attacks, negative memes, hate speech towards uh, uh, civic activists, women are more targeted, so they receive more online verbal abuse than men. So in, and in one of our uh, social media research, so we documented hate speech and death threats against opposition uh, figures and it was explicit threats of sexual violence against uh, female activists. So information campaigns and literacy on human rights, on civil society, on democratic values, so have been almost absent for many years on Kyrgyz speaking social media. So the content was rather enriched by religious stories, entertaining videos, lives of celebrities, so or distorted news. So that the, such a different culture of social media use with different content, different language perception. So this echo chambers that activated social privilege. Uh, so at the Kyrgyz language, social media is instrumentalized that is easily used for manipulation to shift attention away from pro-democratic, oppositional, other critical discourses. So the attack skillfully uh, built on established labels and controversies so, for example, uh, women's rights march or regular uh, Sunday meetings to defend the order of law. So, these events uh, cause like outrage among uh, conservative groups or even like the users of the Kyrgyz language uh, social media. So, and it's not only current regime, um, but also Atambayev, who regularly incited the Kyrgyz public against human rights activists, the independent mass media, opposition leaders, and NGOs by labeling them like traitors, Westerners, and spies. So, and uh, by, uh, by doing this, uh, reproducing conspiracy theories similar to those fomented by the Kremlin so against dissidents in Russia. Um, uh, to conclude my talk, um, 
So uh, I would say that this political force and conservative groups, so they increasingly foster polarization uh, with a view to instrumentalizing these divisions for their own benefits. So, and in turn, this is, uh, as I told, reinforced by conspiracy theories and uh, fake news, uh, so which is also complemented by like attacks, hate speech against against investigative journalists, NGOs, female activists, and other minority groups. So, and uh, in one of uh, our publications, uh, we stressed out our recommendations. So, in uh, such a complex situation, uh, common reaction like uh, from like civil society or liberal groups is uh, the effort to enlighten and to educate the other side. So, but this aggravates polarization because simply exposing people to the real facts or true story or to break down pre-existing beliefs are ineffective. So, and they can accentuate uh, polarization. So they are especially ineffective when they are communicated by untrusted actors or messengers. So, which leads people to stay even more closer to their own group contrary beliefs. So, and uh, instead, um, uh, like groups, they should focus on shaping people's perceptions of norms. So, rather than seeking to educate and change attitudes, so which more likely have developed over a long period of time. So, and uh, I would say liberal actors should focus on shaping norms. So, this is. Yeah, briefly my report on uh, my observation and also uh, participation yeah, in the uh, close discussion in Kyrgyzstan. So that's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kozak, for for kicking us off. And I think that you know, the online dimension is absolutely key to how these messages are evolving and shaping and being shared. Um, before I head to Eric, I I. I had an oversight at the beginning. I want to hand over to Dimitri uh, from our host here at CABA. Um, thank you, Adam. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, good evening, good morning <laughs> to, to everyone. Uh, on behalf of IWPR Central Asia, I want to thank you all for your time attending uh, our today's joint discussion by uh, IWPR Central Asian Foreign Policy Center. And I'm very grateful to our great host and facilitator today, Adam, who is doing a great job, and uh, the, the whole, his team, the whole team of uh, Foreign Policy Center, and our distinguished researchers for the continuous work on studying the Central Asian processes that are happening within our region. Uh, as part of our program activities, which are supported by the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, we try to provide an in-depth analysis to the regional trends, uh, just as our colleagues. What we do, we do uh, discussions about the challenges faced by the uh, Central Asian region. Uh, we are sure that it allows us to bring the international experts and the regional experts uh, all together to hear their opinions on the existing problems and hear possible solutions. Uh, we aim to ensure that the ideas they are shared and that there is a cross fertilization of the ideas. There is a generation of unique ideas and I'm very grateful to the um, to the speech and to the uh, to Gulzad Bayaliva, who just now uh, has finished her speech. That was great, and I'm sure that now we will be able to uh, dive deeper into that and explore all the relations between the new conservatism, how it affects all other uh, different areas of our lives, just as civic space dynamics, or just as the challenges, protection of women's and minority rights in Central Asia. Um, yeah, so we are here today to listen, discuss, and ask questions. So I will not take much of your time and just uh, bring your attention back to the discussion by our experts. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri, and thank you for your kind words, despite me forgetting to bring you in at the beginning, which was uh, which was very kind of you. Um, I will hand now hand over to Eric. Great, thank you. First, let me just do an, a volume check. Is is the volume check okay? If um, okay, very good. Uh, and then uh, you know how the often um, speakers give caveats at the views, etc. Well, my caveat is not going to be that I'm not representing some organization, but I'm doing this in my personal capacity. My caveat is that I'm in a house here in Washington, well, actually in Alexandria, Virginia, with two kids two dogs uh and um apparently the internet provider has decided to do work on the internet so 
if you hear dogs barking or kids screaming or if my internet goes out, uh, I apologize in advance. Hopefully uh, everything will be uh, will work out all well. But that, that, that's, the, uh, that's, that's the age that we live in right now. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I want to thank the Foreign Policy Center. Uh, I want to thank IWPR, uh, the Norwegian Foreign Ministry, for, for sponsoring this event. It's been a little over a year since I was last in the region. I had to leave Kyrgyzstan in March 2020 because our dear president uh, was about to close the borders, so I rushed back home. Um, so it's good to be here, if only virtually. Uh, and so I, I really appreciate the chance to, to meet with you today. Um, my goal is to discuss populism, nationalism, uh, and the implications this has for human rights, in particular in the case of Kyrgyzstan. I am very cognizant of the fact that sitting here in Washington, D.C., I am not the best position to speak to the nuances um, and, and some of the recent events, uh, because I am so distant from the region right now. Um, but what I see is uh, my value added today is that uh, as a political scientist and a political scientist who is very passionate about Central Asia, I think I may be well positioned to bring some insights about the scholarship of populism, the scholarship on nationalism, the scholarship on authoritarianism, and apply that to the specific case of Kyrgyzstan. So I'm not pretending to be an expert on Kyrgyzstan. Uh, I think really my value added is the ability to marry social science theory to the Kyrgyz case. And I'm very grateful for Gulzat for her, her, her fascinating and, and insightful discussion of the current situation of nationalism in, in Kyrgyzstan. So thank you for, for teeing that up very well. Um, my point, my central point uh, is, uh, there's a mixture of good news and Kyr uh, good news and bad news for Kyrgyzstan. And the good news is that um, Kyrgyzstan's not a consolidated authoritarian government. Uh, um, maybe that's setting the bar low, but uh, but if you look at Tajikistan, if you look at Uzbekistan, if you look at Kazakhstan, uh, here we do see much more consolidated authoritarian regimes. Uh, um, so so in that sense, things are things are, are are promising in Kyrgyzstan. The bad news is that it's precisely because Kyrgyzstan is not a or consolidated authoritarian government, that we see the rise of populism and that we see the rise of nationalism. In secure autocratic regimes, there's less of a need for populism, there's less of a need for uh, nationalism for people in power to maintain support and authority. It's really in these regimes uh, where we see contestation, where we see this movement towards populism. And I should say that I'm not trying to otherize Kyrgyzstan by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I think Kyrgyzstan, in contrast to what we saw here in Washington, DC in January, is relatively um, maybe less extreme. I mean, we've, we've just come out of a period in the United States where we see very similar kind of dynamics. So what I'm talking about today in the case of Kyrgyzstan, I think equally applies to the country that I'm currently in, which is the United States. So by no means am I trying to opine from a lofty position here in Washington, D.C. and say, here, Kyrgyzstan, this is the truth. What's happening in my own country is not at all dissimilar from what is happening in Kyrgyzstan. Um, so let me just give you a brief outline of what I want to do. I'm cognizant of the fact that I have about six minutes remaining. Um, I want to give a very thumbnail sketch of the origins of Kyrgyz political contestation, because I think that's important to understanding the origins of Kyrgyz populism. So that'll be my second point, the origins of Kyrgyz populism. And then I will very briefly reference a few data points illustrating that indeed we are seeing Kyrgyz populism. Gulzat has done a fantastic job of laying out that landscape. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend much time on it because I think Gulzat has already, already done that. Uh, and then um, to Dimitri's point, uh, I would like to conclude with a couple of recommendations uh, for how collectively uh, the international community, Kyrgyzstan, uh, people who are here in the United States concerned about populism can begin to address this issue of populism and nationalism. And again, I just wanna stress, what I'm talking about in Kyrgyzstan, we could just substitute the United States and we could be having the same conversation. Um, okay, so as far as the origins of Kyrgyz political contestation, so I argued at the time of Bakia's overthrow in 2010, um, and I got considerable blowback from my colleagues in Kyrgyzstan, but I, I think this argument stands up that uh, the reason for why we see high degrees of contestation in Kyrgyzstan and not elsewhere is once the nature of the Kyrgyz, uh, the nature of the Kyrgyz transition uh, in 1991 um, to the absence of resource wealth, uh, that we may see in other countries in Central Asia. And then uh, the, the strength of local communities, the strength of local religious communities, this is actually something that goes up reference in her, her own comments. 
combined, this is why I think we see contestation. Let me just drill down a little bit more on each of these points. Um, following the Osh riots in 1990, we saw a fracturing of the Kyrgyz political elite. We saw riots elsewhere in Central Asia uh, in the 1980s, uh, and we saw the Central Party, the Central Communist Party at the time coming back together in this movement into the post-Soviet period with a unified political elite. And you very much see this in the case of Uzbekistan. You see this in the case of Kazakhstan. Uh, there's been far less political contestation. I think that's a legacy of the nature of the transition moment uh, in these countries. Um, as far as scarce nat natural resources, Kyrgyzstan, unlike Uzbekistan, unlike particularly Kazakhstan, does not have vast resource wealth with which an authoritarian power can consolidate autocracy, right? So uh, Michael Ross has written about this extensively. When, uh, when, when autocrats have lots of resource wealth, they don't need to draw on the population for revenues, rather they can hand out revenues. And as a result, they're less, these autocrats are far less accountable to the population. There's far less bottom-up demand uh, on, on, on autocrats in these, in these situations. And Kyrgyzstan is very different, right? There's a lot of bottom-up demand because the Kyrgyz government is so dependent on the population for revenues for, daily, for the daily functioning of the government. And then the last thing uh, in Kyrgyzstan in particular, and Gulzat has already laid out the topography here, we do see very strong religious communities. It's not that they don't exist elsewhere in Central Asia, but that, you know, what is different about Kyrgyzstan is these communities are not persecuted and repressed to the extent that we've seen them repressed, particularly in the case of Uzbekistan or Tajikistan. Um, and as a result, we see civil society emerging around these religious communities. And I should also say emerging out of some very strong local identities, kinship identities. And when you have social capital around these communities with shared norms, these communities can overcome what we call in political science, the collective action dilemma. It's much easier to protest, to put pressure on the government when you have these shared bonds. And in Kyrgyzstan, we see this in spades. Um, so that's, that's the, I think, the reason why we have contestation in Kyrgyzstan in a nutshell. Um, what about populism and nationalism? Uh, well, and, and this is where I think we're getting to Dimitri's call for policy recommendations. But the the thrust of inter the international development community the thrust of the international development scholarship and i would say the thrust of civil society organizations in Kyrgyzstan is this idea that civil society is inherently a good thing, right? That, that civil society brings about good things like liberalization and democracy. Um, and there's been some really good research by people like Sherry Berman, uh, her study on Weimar Germany, um, more recently Pippa Norris and Ron Engelhart in the study of Trumpism in the United States, that civil society can bring about illiberal outcomes as easily as it can liberal outcomes. Uh, and so I think this is what we're seeing in Kyrgyzstan today. Uh, the very thing that the international community and the Kyrgyz nonprofit group and the NGOs have worked on so diligently in the 1990s, this, uh, this, this, this uh, effort to build shared social norms to bring out political liberalization, uh, this is also enabling uh, civil society to bring about illiberal things like nationalism and populism. You can you can champion illiberal ideas just as easily as you can champion, champion liberal ideas. And I think that's what we're beginning to see in Kyrgyzstan today. And that's for sure what we're seeing in the United States today. Um, so just a few empirical data points. I see I'm at eight minutes. Uh, and some of the things that we can maybe talk about in the, in the question and answer, um, you know, the discourse around LGBTQ plus issues in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, this is a, a favorite topic for the nationalist and populist movements in Kyrgyzstan, uh, um, pointing out this, the, this, this, this uh, embattled community as a threat to, to Kyrgyz culture, Kyrgyz identity. Um, this is a, a sore topic to raise, uh, maybe in an environment like this, but the whole the whole discourse around Askarov's detention and, and lamentably his, you know, his sad passing away in prison, in, in, in a Kyrgyz prison um, after the after the 2010 uh, riots in southern Kyrgyzstan. Um, so, uh, you know, anti-Uzbek nationalism. Um, and then uh, the, the last point, and again, Gulzat talked about this, but this, this widespread disdain for gender rights Rights and feminism among Kyrgyz nationalists. Uh, these are all examples, these are all data points that we can point to that illustrate this rise of populism and to a certain extent nationalism in Kyrgyzstan. So I've got, uh, I'm at nine minutes, I've got one minute. Um, what's to be done? What are we supposed to do here? Uh, well, I would say there's two things. I'm sure there's a host of things uh, that we could consider, but there's two things in particular that I'd like to point your attention to. The first thing is I would say that Kyrgyzstan 
would benefit, and this is where actually Kyrgyzstan and the United States do differ. Kyrgyzstan would benefit greatly if it had predictable, strong, and stable institutions that can maintain a level playing field so as to, to ensure the unpredictability of democracy. So democracy is defined by unpredictability. We don't know who's going to win elections, but the only way you can secure the unpredictability of democracy is if political elites don't trample on the constitution, don't trample on electoral laws, don't tra trample the judiciary. How do you go about building these stable institutions? Your guess is as good as mine. So it's a little bit easy for me to suggest that. It, the hard part is how do you bring about stable institutions? And that's a much more complicated question. Um, the second thing is something I think there is greater agency for people like you, people like me to, to, to begin to think about right now. Um, and this is to think about civil society, I would say much the same way that we have gradually come to think about the internet. Now, I was fascinated by Gulzat's conversation about the internet in Kyrgyzstan today. If you rewind to 2010, 2011, and you look at the Arab uprisings, there was this assumption that the internet was inherently a good thing in liberalizing and was going to help about bring about democratic reform. Um, we no longer hold that assumption about the internet. And we see that it can be as problematic as it is as as a good thing. I don't think civil society and our perception of civil society has reached that level, that, that, that degree of, of um, you know, ambivalence that we have for the internet. I think we have to begin to bring this healthy ambivalence to civil society as well and recognize that civil society, it helps overcome collective action, but it can help overcome collective action both for liberal ends and for illiberal ends. And regrettably in the United States, regrettably in Kyrgyzstan, I think we're beginning to see civil society move us towards more illiberal ends than liberal ends. So I'll conclude there and I'll turn it back over to Adam and Dimitri, thank you. That's very helpful, Eric, thank you. I mean, there's a big debate about the role of civil society in, 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 in general. And obviously you, know, you and I have both worked on in the past, you know, groups that were explicitly illiberal themselves and you know, then mimicking the form and function uh, of um, more liberal civil society, but also some of the stuff we've done more re some in, in the more recent publication was around, you know, the sort of blowback that liberal so attempts by liberal civil society have engendered not through their own fault but through you know counter narratives and i think it's a it's a it's a there the interplay between um the liberal ideas and, and this neoconservatism that we're talking about today is is absolutely crucial um uh, moving away from kyrgyzstan um to uzbekistan um delighted to bring in uh, nazima Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, well, um, I think that situation uh, in Central Asia is so similar that you can, you know, just repeat the same stories that were told before me and just copy paste and add some gender issues um, in the context and just, you know, to tell a new story. And Eric actually was uh, speaking so fast that I will have hard times, to, you know, to keep the pace. Um, well, um, I will be talking about um, traditionalism in Uzbekistan, the growing as I think traditionalism in Uzbekistan, um, and the role of women in the uh, discourse um, of um, the national identity and national values. How women are seen within this rhetoric, uh, within the official the public rhetoric, and also how uh, women's roles are uh, perceived and seen ideally by uh, the uh, general public, by the audience, by, by ordinary citizen, uh, citizens. Um, if we first try to recognize what traditionalism is or what is conservatism, um, and of course, uh, these terms for Uzbekistan um, are very um, relative, and we first have to figure out um, that we can compare it, for instance, with uh, what we had um, in the past during Karimov's era or during the Soviet time. Um, and I think that we have to come back to the pre-Soviet times and um, here starts the um, history of uh, conservatism and traditionalism that is very much mixed with uh, um, religiosity in society. Um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, 
um, Karim have exploited the discourse of national identity and of glorious past that was in uh, pre-Soviet times and he uh, was depicting the Soviet Union as um, um, imperialists um, and that was uh, the discourse that was constructed against the Soviet past in order to, you know, to figure out the nation, nation building identity, national um, values. And all this discourse actually had a great impact on young people and in general um, to the citizens of Uzbekistan. We, we have different speculations today on whether the Manaviat and Marfat ideology had a great impact on people or it was um, perceived with uh, great skepticism um, or not. But if we, um, um, when I talk to young people, when I talk to people um, in general with ordinary people that have nothing to do with politics um, and not engaged in uh, political, discourse, they usually, um, th their thoughts usually stem from this ideology and they usually refer to those national values and national identity. However, um, the national identity um, is not conceptualized um, in any legal document. Uh, but at the same time, uh, from the Karimov's era and up to, to present day, this is kind of, you know, um, habit um, legal habit, if you want, to use every time uh, the concept of national values of Mili Qadriyatlar in every legal document, and especially um, as regards uh, women and gender issues. So uh, with this growing traditionalism, as I call it uh, traditionalism, because um, in this uh, traditional or conservative discourse, uh, people uh, start to question very basic and fundamental principles of human rights. And then uh, they try to substitute them with their traditional values and vision of how it should work, of how the society should function. And um, here is what I call as uh, traditionalism um, and conservatism in Uzbekistan. This all is uh, mixed with uh, religiosity. And again, we can say that uh, during Karimov's era, um, the um, tough, repressive authoritarian regime was trying to substitute um, the religion or to um, keep uh, the grip um, on religion and to use religion as um, as a tool of, you know, fixing their own ideology in the minds of people. Um, at the same time, um, the the official discourse actually was exploiting the religious rhetoric in order to um, to control the minds of people. And in this very discourse, um, the women's roles were very inferior, um, since uh, the rhetoric and the discourse itself uh, was very, very patriarchal. Um, and in uh, numerous books and speeches of Karimov, uh, women were seen mainly as the mothers of nation, but not active in political um, arena, not uh, definitely not as political or social leaders. Of course, they were in, in some sense leaders, but very locally within the traditional um, entity of Mahalla. And you know that Mahalla has very, like, um very um strange at some point um ambiguous role in um uh, social policy in uh, political surveillance um and it it is kind of a mix of uh, self governing uh, body and um uh, the body that is used by law enforcement bodies in order to you know to watch the people and as a means of surveillance um, um, over uh, citizens and in this very discourse uh, women were seen as um, some complementary instrument uh, in nation building and they were seen as uh, the guards of chase the guards of uh, national um, identity, of national values, but someone who would be helping um, a patriarch, a man, to build uh, this society, this new and strong society. And of course, um, the, um, the, the present government um, 
has changed the, the discourse and it is talking much about uh, the women empowerment issues and actually the very term gender was introduced um, officially into the discourse and this is something new for uh, the discourse on, on women empowerment and uh, women's rights. We have adopted lots of um, uh, legal documents and normative acts uh, that will have um, that have to have a huge role in empowering women, but uh, still uh, women's roles uh, de facto are becoming even more inferior than in the past. Um, um, if uh, we consider the growing, um, and let's put it readiness for religion, I mean Islam, and uh, the growing popularity of uh, the Islamic bloggers, and Islamic rhetoric in uh, informal social media uh, discourse, then in all of these discourses, women put as inferior and they are usually blamed for being too liberal, too emancipated, uh, too powerful. And um, they, um, according to this um, conservative discourse, they um, have to be treated, treated according to the Sharia. Um, um principles and norms um so um, uh, of course uh we cannot uh know for sure the real situation because we really lack some social research into this we don't really know how the young people uh see the women but uh from what i see from my experience and when i talk to people and uh, from like uh, broader masses of people and especially young people they see the gender issues as something that um actually um contradict uh the male dignity uh, and this is a very um um, opposing to uh, male uh, dignity and identity. So uh, the, the, the uh, popular discourse is becoming even more conservative. But at the same time, we need to understand that there is also backlash from the liberal part of uh, society. It is um, in minority, but uh, it is actually opposing these conservative views. And uh, the gap between the conservative um conservatists and uh, uh the liberals um is is really uh broadening um and again we need to um to understand the the great um there may be liberal people um in terms of uh, their political views uh their views to economy democracy and human rights but they don't necessarily include um, women's rights into this issue. They may have a very conservative uh, vision of women's rights at the same time. Um, and um, in this regard, actually, um, the government is balancing between um, the liberal views and the conservative views. But um, actually, de facto, uh, if not consider the legal documents and the legal, let's say, line uh, the official line of the government, uh, we have to admit that uh, the the real politics is towards conservatism because uh, they need to balance uh, the majority of people. But the majority of people here may be thinking that, that women's rights is not something that is needed uh, to be um, advanced in the near future. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you very much, Susanna. And yeah, it's those 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 tensions, and I think particularly in Uzbekistan, when it's trying to show a modernizing face to the world, that is the, sort of the third dimension. Is not only the domestic discourse, but how uh, uh, how it's trying to shape its perceptions of uh, internationally and how that. Uh, that feeds back. Um, we've had a couple of questions in the chat so far. Uh, I will try and get to them, but please do um, feel free to add more there. Um, I think the, one of the questions that we have received is quite an important central one, and we've talked about this in different ways, but from Anvar Umarov, who, who's asking, uh, he'd like to get a clear definition description of conservatism. And I think what we are clear about is, um, you know, we've talked about different trends here. We've talked about traditionalism. We've talked about um, growing Islamization. We've and um, we've also touched more recently in, in what uh, uh, in, in some of the things around sort of international sort of populist social conservative trends. And there's also issues around sort of toxic masculinity and particular identities of 
maleness that uh, both are from the very traditional, but also in a sort of more modern uh, sense. Uh, where you are seeing uh, online communities promote visions of, of masculinity that implicitly undermine women's rights. So I'd be interested to get views from the panel about what uh, uh, what, what you think. Uh, who would like to go first? Um, anyone want to so jump yeah, in on I I conceptions of... Yeah. So about the uh, like definition of description of conservatism, yeah, it's... It's, yeah, it's uh, very difficult. And um, as for my talk, um, you could see that uh, within the conservatism also, they can be like a, uh, like a level sort of like distinctions of who is to what extent is like conservative. For example, for traditionalists, uh, those who want to preserve or to revive like traditions. Uh, so to them, for example, this, uh, like, New is uh, too conservative, which leads to uh, which lead the society, like uh, according to them, like to uh, 15th century back. So, like uh, you see, it's very hard. And uh, uh, just in a nutshell, I would say conservatism is, uh, as in the term itself stays, it is uh, like the movement of the group uh, which tries to preserve or to conserve, like. Uh, traditional norms or some traditional or, or religious values. So, yeah. Anyone else want to come in on that point um, before we move on to one of the questions? I can, I just, I just building on Glazat's uh, um, point, and I'd be very interested to hear uh, Nazima, uh, uh, Nazima lay this out a little bit more in the case of Uzbekistan. Um, uh, I think I just one thing I'd like to add to what Gulzat said is, uh, yes, conservatism, I think broadly speaking, we could say this is a, a movement that seeks to defend tradition. Uh, but I think we can't stop there because tradition itself is contested. Uh, and so uh, in the case of, and this gets to um, uh, Mr. Kamala's question as well, uh, well, you know, when we when we start talking about religion in, say, a place like Kyrgyzstan, what is traditional Islam in, in a place like Kyrgyzstan? That itself is is up for debate. Right. And so um, uh, I remember um, speaking with a mom, a mom, uh, Aman Kamalov in southern Kyrgyzstan about this. Uh, you know, it, what, what is traditional Islam is 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 very much debated by the clergy in, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so I think we can't just stop that. It's a support for traditionalism. I think we have to interrogate what traditionalism is uh, and then just acknowledge that that there's competing traditionalisms in a place like Kyrgyzstan and, and competing traditions in a place like uh, Uzbekistan. So it, it's, it's, an, it's an impossible question to, to answer, but it's a critically important question to ask. Fantastic. Uh, Nazima, do you want to come in on that one? Um, yeah, that's a tough question. Um, you see, um, the, uh, the discourse in Uzbekistan um, is that uh, there is a clear distinction between the religious, uh, just uh, like, religiously conservative views and secularly conservative views. Um, and if we talk about uh, the women's rights or humans, uh, human rights, then um, women's rights uh, in both camps can be seen um, very conservative. Um, and uh, they, uh, they are treated from both camps conservatively and traditionally. Um, another question is uh, that um, the growing religiosity and readiness for religion, for new forms of religion um, also uh, will make the society and the overall views of uh, the people more and more traditional. But uh, this does not mean that uh, religiosity will necessarily um, oppress women, because um, there are also people that follow Islam, uh, that follow Sharia rules, but they allow their daughters to go to school and um, to go to universities and give them brilliant education. But um, another um, issue is that the traditions 
uh, which see women as mainly mothers and wives will doom them to, uh, to their very, very traditional roles. Yes, you can uh, provide women with education, but for what you are providing her with education? It is a popular belief that um, girls need education to be good mothers and to educate their children. And it is also a um, very popular assumption that an educated girl will become a good killing uh, daughter-in-law and will serve um, the family of your husband much better so that the family of her husband is going to have better dividends if her if their um, Kellen is more educated. So um, for girls, what does it mean for girls? These perspectives give girls a better perspectives in the, in the market of marriage, let's say. So in this regard, considering all this, we can say that um, uh, for women's rights, um, all of this, uh, all of those camps may become traditionalizing. You just want to quickly explain Kellen for the those who aren't. Yes. Um, this con concept is about, um, it is, um, if we um, translate it, it is daughter-in-law, uh, but in the Central Asian culture, it is, um, it means that you are kind of a person um, with various attributes of a kind of servant that comes to a family of your husband to serve the others. And this is um, a very, she has a very interesting position in this hierarchy, in this social hierarchy, uh, which puts her um, inferior uh, towards the others. And if she serves, um, if she goes through this service uh, with dignity, with um, patience, then she will reach the level of, uh, of a person that can be treated more or less equally. And this uh, concept of Kilen actually makes women to hate the other women because finally uh, they themselves become very furious and evil mothers-in-law in the future. And actually this brings another discourse that actually women are oppressing another women. This is, uh, these are not men that are oppressing women. But again, this is a very um, um, interesting discourse because uh, they are becoming um, oppressed killings or oppressive mothers-in-law, Hainana, um, in a very, very patriarchal um, system of values. Yeah, no, I, I, th I think just one of the things we're thinking about more is how, in order to change the balance on some of these things, you're going to have to involve how do you change attitudes amongst men in order to be able to take on more responsibility within both their own households and that of their wider family, and also trying to reduce stigma against other forms of elder care and uh, social care that yeah. ultimately you know, means that you're not relying on your daughter-in-law to be the one that provide, looks after you in old age. And there's a long-term cultural and structural things that have to happen as well as um, just proactively promoting uh, women's rights. Just, I, I, I've known a lot, a lot of questions, but there is one thing that I think appears to be rele particularly relevant to the discussion we're having right now. And that's from Majdek uh, uh talking about, you know, we have been sort of framing some of these discussions in terms of discourses of traditionalism and liberalism um, and what is the role of nation building um, and how that affects these dialogues. I think, is there anything else because um, obviously, yeah, we, we, a number of people have talked about the role of you know, building national identity uh, on some of these building blocks. And I don't, given that we're talking roughly in this area at the moment, does anyone else want to come in in response to my ex uh, comments? Um, your voice uh, disappears. Sorry for this. Um, I'm trying to to find the question. Maybe you uh, can you repeat or just point. So, to the so, so my asks, why are all the presenters using a Western concept of traditionalism and liberalism in the context of Central Asia? It has no bearing on the situation in Central Asia today. Why don't we talk about nation building in which in which the context in Central Asia can manifest itself in various ways? So I was just thinking, I mean, a number of you did mention the role of nation building and national identity in your opening remarks, but I just wasn't sure whether you wanted to build on, on that in response to his comments. Mm, yeah, so uh, just, 
I want to share the link that that was a special issue on the practices of traditionalization. So yeah, instead of using uh, like conservatism or traditionalism, uh, there's a term of traditional. Traditionalization or even retraditionalization. So, in the context of my screen for this, hello, can hello. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Hello, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know where I, I was frozen. Uh, so, I, I, yeah, I, I was saying that I just shared um, the interesting and useful uh, special issue on the traditionalization practices in Central Asia. Uh, so, perhaps it was uh, if we were using uh, this like Western concepts, it was just uh, the naming of it. But of course it is related. And as I told in my presentation, it is directly related to the nationhood, to the nation building process in uh, Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia. So, and please, uh, if you just check the special issue I share. Fantastic. Uh, Eric, is there anything more you want to come in? Yeah, so I, I was trying in my comments to be careful to say that traditionalism uh, is something that is contested, right? And I, I, you know, I try to specifically make that point, uh, and you can contest it, contest it from from multiple perspectives. So, uh, if I fell into a discourse that somehow imbued traditionalism with Western conceptualization, I apologize for that. My, my main point is is that uh, you know I, I think it's contested and. Uh, it, it varies from from situation to situation. There's it, it's there's no there there. Right? I guess is the point. Um, but I think this point about nation building is critically important. And so I you know I would like to say one thing about that. And uh, there's a lot of scholarship that demonstrates that um, I might get into some trouble here. But uh, there's a lot of scholarship that demonstrates that countries that come about or come into existence without much of a fight uh, that kind of receive independence or sovereignty by default tend to struggle for a long time. Uh, and whereas countries that uh, come about as a result of war and conflict and, and you know, um, trial by fire, uh, they these countries tend to ultimately have uh, stronger governments um, and, and less and less chaos. Uh, Charles Tilley has this famous quote, war made the state and the state made war. Um, it's a very disturbing and unsettling, uh, I think, empirical observation, but I think it's one that's borne out by the facts. And if you look at Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan is a country, and this is where I'm going to get in trouble, but Kyrgyzstan is a country that receives statehood kind of by let me say, receive statehood passively. Um, uh, and, and I think we're seeing some of the legacy of that. Some of the battles that typically go into the state formation process uh, are now playing out in Kyrgyzstan um, because they didn't play out at, at, the, at the moment of independence. And, and I realize I'm inviting a whole bunch of, of, of uh, blowback here, um, but I think this is uh, an empirical observation that has been borne out in much of the social science literature. Well, and it's also you're seeing it now in the in, in the new constitution framing, and, and it's happened in previous attempts to reframe the Kyrgyz constitution that it, it's you're building up what it is to be Kyrgyz within that, um, uh, and actually Kyrgyz rather than Kyrgyzstani in terms of some of the the the, the, the differentiations there. Um, just while we're with you, Eric, um, there was something from Jan texted by about the link between conservatism and class, and I think particularly there might be some relevant stuff in the U.S. context. Here around whether sort of particular groups uh, at the lower end of the wealth distribution are disproportionately more likely to be open to those uh, these sort of narratives. Um, I don't know if you saw that. I mean, it's it's, it's a great question, and uh, um, I don't pretend to have the knowledge that either Nazima or Gulzat have for the Central Asia case, but uh, within the U.S. case. There is this perception that that less economically advantaged classes tend to gravitate towards conservatism more than more economically advantaged classes. Um, that's actually not what we're finding. Uh, so uh, we're um, and again, I'll point you to the work of Norris and Engelhardt on this score. Uh, but if you look at the rise of authoritarian populism and conservatism in the United States, and I suspect the same may be true in Central Asia, uh, is you see an interesting coalition of both economically disadvantaged uh, as well well as the um, older, often wealthy populations that suddenly find themselves in the minority. So uh, um, older white uh, 
um, uh, um, older white wealthy populations in the United States who feel threatened by the influx of immigration in the United States, as well as people in the Rust Belt who feel threatened. So the I think the unifying thing that brings people together under this umbrella of conservatism is this perception of threat in the context of a changing society. And it's not something that is exclusively economic done. I think I see the same thing going on in Kyrgyzstan. Um, I, I would defer to Nazima on Uzbekistan, um, but I'd be very interested to see what Gulzat and Nazima have to say on the score. Do either of you want to come in, come in at this point? Then I'm aware there are some questions from earlier from John Burris and others. Nazima. Yeah, um, maybe I couldn't hear it well because uh, the voice is still disappearing. I have very bad connection. Um, um, whether this traditionalism has economic roots, right? Um, yeah, and to what extent people yeah. from lower income are more susceptible, more interested in these type of narratives? Yes. Oh well, um, of course, um, the um, the influence of economic, social, economic reasons is really huge. But uh, this is, um, I will um, agree with Eric that this is not everything. Um, and uh, maybe from the beginning of, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, the economic uh, situation, um, uh, the break of the economic system, of the stability and the stability of social protection contributed to inferiority of women in the society. Because um, at some point women were forced to stay home to care about their houses because in the during the Soviet Union the situation was different. They were forced to go to work to factories and to get emancipated to earn money to maintain their family equally to men, and that was an ideal of a Soviet woman. But in uh, New Uzbekistan the situation changed drastically, and um, at that point because of the lack of social security and social protection, women had to stay home and to you know get boxed into. Um, get bogged with uh, their domestic duties. And today, in the discourse of uh, domestic labor, um, uh, the issue of men helping women is, you know, very, um, it's, it may provoke um, anger from the male's part, and even women um, actually um oppose uh, this type of thinking that men may be helping uh women at home with their children and they are in a very minority those who really help uh, their women and um actually if um, we uh speak about uh, the congruence of positions of the government and the people um, there is a backlash from the conservatives against the reforms, we may think so, but in the government are the same people that represent the, the, uh, the, the ordinary citizens. I mean, they have the same values, they have the same traditional settings, they, may, they, may, they might be thinking about the same thing. And economic, um, economic well-being, um, in this case, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very traditional context, may actually contribute to even more traditional uh, view of women's roles, because if uh, they are maintained mainly by males, uh, their husbands, their sons, they don't have any necessity to work and to have their, you know, social, um, social leadership, and uh, they are believed not to have any incentive to go to work and to have social approval, let's say. Sure, no, thank you. And anyway, I suppose just in interest, we were talking about killing organization earlier. The, one of the issues obviously is with migrant, uh, with, with communities of migrant workers, if you've got uh, you know, women left behind in their husband's family's home for many years, that yeah, exacerbates, uh, potentially exacerbates some of the problems that women are facing in, the, in this community. So that is again, a, a pro practical impact of, of economic dislocation um, there, which possibly falls outside the immediate discussion we're having. Um, Gozak, do you want to come in on this at all? Or, um, we, don't, um, no one, we don't have to come in on everything, but just wanted to clear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe just uh, briefly uh, comment about this correlation of like middle class or economically wealthy uh, people with uh, their perception, uh, they're being perceptive to um, conservatism. I mean. Uh, as I told, so this conservative uh, ideas, values, and norms, they come with the information. So, and uh, it is still. A 
I think so. I, I haven't thought uh, deeply into that, but I still think that uh, it's also based on this um, uh, Kyrgyz speaking and Russian speaking. So if we take like middle class or wealthy, uh, wealthier people, uh, Russian speaking, so maybe they are less uh, uh, percept they are less perceptive to conservatism than their like Kyrgyz speaking counterparts. Yeah, that's just my brief comment. But, yeah. Thanks so much. And, and that role of language, uh, so the difference between, I mean, obviously in, in a Kyrgyz context, it, Russian and Kyrgyz speaking is not necessarily a, a, a an ethnic marker, it's a, it's a social and economic marker, but just hopping back to a question John Boas asked uh, right at the beginning of the section, as John's a former uh, MEP and uh, and former uh, Vice President of the EU delegation, uh, Parliament delegation in Central Asia, and picking back on the issues around the divisions that were there some time ago between the Russian population that remained in Central Asia, uh, in terms of class and uh, and 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 sort of certain and and obviously at the time, uh, there were sort of higher positions in certain professions and governments that were still retained by Russian communities, and you know that was then obviously a source of social tension. Um, obviously, the, we know that there has been sort of a gradual. Um, reduction in the size of the Russian population across Central Asia over the last 10, 20 years. But I'd be interested to know whether there are any particular issues around the sort of Russian dimension um, that you guys want to pick up in terms of uh, how the Russian communities are being related to in those countries. And obviously we know in Uzbekistan there are issues around the role of Russian as a language and, and obviously we know in, in, in Kyrgyzstan for slightly different reasons uh, that's there. I'd be interested if anyone wants to come in on, on, on that particular issue around divisions between the Russian and, uh, and titular nationalities. You know, one thing I would say, and I think, um, uh, John, this is a, a great question. Um, the, the landscape has changed a fair amount um, over the but now three decades since since the Soviet collapse. Uh, and when one walks around today uh, in your hometown in, in say Kyrgyzstan or, or wherever you are in Central Asia, um, you'll see far fewer Russians. Uh, so one might be immediately inclined to think that the Russian influence has faded, uh, both in government um, and in daily life. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and, and here I welcome anybody's feedback, but it is something that, that Marlene Laurel and I are looking into. I would argue that the Russian media presence uh, has come in um, uh, and is, is very much shaping uh, the landscape in Central Asia. So even though the number of Russians may be fewer and the day-to-day -day interactions with Russians may be fewer and their presence in governments may be fewer, the fact that Russian media does a lot of the framing of the discourse in Central Asia, um, and even in titular language reporting, you find Russian media being uh, um, more or less translated verbatim into the local languages, that also shapes uh, views. So, you know, I think the Russian influence is still very much present uh, and is very much informing this dialogue that we're having today around human rights, around populism, around traditionalism and conservatism. But yeah, but it, as you said, in terms of the numbers of people who are there holding senior jobs, it has yeah, there has been a significant shift over the last thirty years. Um, anyone else want to come in on this? I know, I know. Um, Nazima, is there anything on the role of Russian as a national language in Uzbekistan that you want to address at all? Um, well, oh, hello. Um, yeah. Um, um, actually, um, the heated debates um, occurred um, last year yes. yeah, or two years ago um, regarding the Russian, Russian language and granting its official status. Um, you see how um, in a public discourse, the Russian language is uh, put as, um, as opposition to, uh, to traditionalism. Um, this happens because of uh, the remaining minority of Russian-speaking people and um, 
you know, the Russian language is um, obviously diminishing and this is a very natural process. Um, I don't really um, see any oppression from the governmental agencies to, like against the Russian language uh, or oppression of the Russian speaking population. But um, there is certain backlash from the nationalists and those who advocate for uh, the Uzbek language and uh, using Uzbek language in uh, the public domain. Um, and actually this um, has probably a conflicting potential in the future. Uh, but we have to admit that in the future uh, there is um, a very small space uh, for Russian speaking people and um, maybe it will be substituted by the English language. Uh, but again, um, this is um, unlikely um, because for English um, you need you, you have to have more resources and in uh, to learn it to get access to English speaking sources uh, but uh, the the remaining Russian speaking uh, public is very very much and heavily um, affected by the Russian propaganda. They watch the Russian TV and they um, uh, consume the Russian propaganda. So um, if you talk to them, um, they are very much pro-Russian. Uh, but also there are um, there is a strata of people which are Russian speaking, but they are against the Russian uh, policy and they advocate for uh, being more liberal than the authoritarian <laughs> Russia. So the you see the. So uh, yeah, um, the, the society is very fragmented and I think that Uzbekistan is not unique in this. Fantastic, thank you. Um, okay, um, we've got a couple of questions about uh, the role of civil society. Uh, one from, from Mira, um, which is about, um, she asks how civil society, if strong enough, can counter sort of mob rule in, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, Eric said that civil society in Kyrgyzstan is, is still stronger, be both liberal and illiberal. How can civil society fight against corrupt officials who come to power and enrich themselves personally? Um, basically, what role can civil society play in the absence of rule of law, judicial independence uh, to ensure sort of accountability? Uh, and one of, and that links from um, Vegas Vogel von Vogelstein, who I, I apologies if that's, uh, I, that may or may not be a, a, a pseudonym. Um, the, um, the currently any asking a similar question, a related question around uh, in Uzbekistan, any sort of liberal movements promoting human rights, women's rights that should be taken politically seriously in Uzbekistan, do these movements lack leverage in the present day? I mean, we know um, Nimolchi, um, uh, does a, and, and Irina Matvinenko does amazing work in Uzbekistan, uh, raising awareness of uh, domestic violence issues and women's rights more generally. But obviously, we know there is a fundamental structural issue around the inability of independent NGOs to register, um, which obviously impacts the ability for, um, you know, building out the capacity in in Uzbekistan. That in the same way that that you know there has been that that, that build out of civil society in in Kyrgyzstan. Um, does anyone want to come in on either of those two questions around the role of liberal-minded civil society, either to you know to, to hold governments to account and to um, deal with um, promotion of values in 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 this better context? Cool. Uh, so yeah, I, I will try. Uh, so um, if we look at this um, at the role of civil society from the perspective of uh, of the state. So the recent events showed us that they're not afraid of like liberal oriented civil society. Uh, so it was uh, evident um, during the clash on the square where like, let's say civil society, they, they lost. So uh, they're, they're not threatened by civil society, let's say at all. So they can prosecute, they can do, whatever they want, I mean, the state. So, and in general, in Kyrg Kyrgyz um, community or society, the perception of rule of law is different. So uh, is it like uh, law, tradition or religion is on the stake? So 
uh, it's not clear. I mean, uh, what the overall uh, general uh, Kyrgyz people, what they what they see uh, as a like uh, universal or uh, preferred yeah rule rule of traditions, rule of religion, or rule of law. So this perception is also different if if we look at the whole uh, like uh, constituents of the country. Uh, that's why. So it's uh, when uh, yeah, I see a lot, uh, like, um, on the one hand, it's like euphoria that uh, we will prosper, Kyrgyz people will prosper, so we now have the leader, the hero, blah, blah. And on the other hand, it's like um, this uh, liberal-oriented, mostly urban civil society who lament and say, like, uh, who can defend the law? Why, like, all these corrupt people are coming back again? So uh, what is missing there is uh, that the rule of law is maybe misunderstood or it's not uh, studied yet, it's overlooked how people, uh, like general, like Kyrgyz people, how they understand this rule of law. Yeah. Thank you. Um, er Eric or Nazima, do you want to come in on, on these civil society points? Um, yeah, um, there are different types of social activism. They are mainly on social media because uh, there, you know, there is a question whether there are any uh, movements, political movements that can be um, considered seriously. Um, I can't really see any political movement because um, in this um, regard, the political environment is still not liberal. Um, and all the uh, social activism is on, in social media. But um, in traditional sense, as also it was said, that why we are considering the Western type of traditionalism, why we are categorizing it as a Western type, um, according to the Western type of traditionalism. But if we again consider it from the Western type of traditionalism, um, uh, the activism is not necessarily liberal. I mean, um, they may be conservative in their essence, they may be conservative to national values, um, they may be conservative and very traditional in terms of everyday life, uh, but they may have very, very liberal political views, uh, but again, not um, uh, regarding the women's rights. Uh, the women's rights uh, is something uh, that actually unites um, the, all the groups, all the camps, and almost all the camps are more or less conservative regarding the women's rights. Uh, but also there are uh, social um, activists uh, in social media which are Russian speaking and they are liberal, liberal from both uh, categories. Like if we consider them as westernized, if we consider them liberal um, in terms of women's rights, everything uh, according to the Western standards. But um, uh, the Uzbek speaking social media is very rich for social activists and according to like daily life and traditions, they may be very conservative, but liberal uh, towards the politics. But again, they don't have a um, certain agenda, I mean political agenda, they may be opposing something, they may be writing against government, but they don't have um, the kind of um, uh, well formulated political agenda. Excellent, thank you. Uh, uh, well, I mean, well, absolutely, we've seen you know, a lot of stuff that would have happened in civil a civil society setting ha taking place in a media or quasi-media situation in in Uzbekistan in terms of um, you know a blog some bloggers and social media activism rather than you know, organised groups. Um, anyone else on that one? Then, if not, I want to pick up on. There's been a, a discussion um, about the role of the Mahala and the sort of local community. Um, obviously, both you know the, there are similarities and, and slight differences between different countries in the region about the role of the sort of most local level of, of, of social organisation. Um, and Nazima mentioned obviously the way it can be used as a form of uh, you know sort of promoting traditional cultural values uh, in a local setting. I was talking recently with, with someone about how, you know, how it, you know, but basically sort of, it has a, you know, as with, as with some form of ultra local government across the world, there is a, a tendency towards small C conservatism, whether that, you know, 
um, manifests itself in terms of you know, things about box hedges and you know specific things here in the UK, so certain particular political priorities in the in, in a in the British or international uh, Western context, or in terms of promoting sort of social social norms. Uh, it's an it's an important dimension of how the sort of local community comes together in a sort of semi formal way to put pressure towards conformity, uh, particularly on this the gender norms. And I think you know, we've seen uh, my talk about what why isn't even downplay it, saying downplaying Mahalo as a social concept. I, I didn't get the feeling that she was downplaying it. I think she was saying it was a very important social concept, but it's one that uh, has operates in certain certain ways in. Uh, in Uzbekistan at the moment, and similarly, uh, Gaim um, talked about it being Mahala from being a source of social support turned into a source of social or even political control. I don't know whether there's anyone else who wants to maybe uh, Gulzat Arak from a Kyrgyzstan perspective to give Nazim a bit of a break. Is there anything that you want to say about that role of ultra local sort of community support? Not just so not just the immediate and extended family, but that sort of wider network in villages, particularly in villages and, and smaller communities around sort of reinfor promoting and reinforcing um, these values. Um, I'll say something and then uh, be keen to hear uh, Gulzat's more expertise uh, commentary here. But, um, you know, in the case of Uzbekistan, and maybe this can can piggyback on some of Nazimo's points, I mean, one of the fundamental challenges that uh, non-democratic governments have is in collecting information. So it's very hard to understand what's going on at the local level in authoritarian settings. Uh, be, you know, in a non-authoritarian setting, that information is channeled up through representative institutions to central governments. Uh, the Mahala uh, operates in a way much like uh, local elections in China operate. This is a way for the central government to collect information, to get feedback from society in the absence of representative institutions, which might do it in a, um, uh, in, in a, in a democracy. So uh, I think Nazima's portrayal of how, in, in the comments she talks about this, about how the Uzbek government is using this institution is spot on. Um, I, you know, I think the Kyrgyz government, and here I really would like to turn the floor over to Gulzat, I think the Kyrgyz government has been far less successful in channeling information from these uh, local organizations, local religious organizations, and there's far greater autonomy. Um, and as a result, we, we do see a fair amount of breakdown between the center and the regions because the Kyrgyz government really has no mechanism for channeling information from the local level to the central level. But Gulzat, you're far more expert on this, so, so why don't you come in here? So, yeah, I, I agree, Eric, uh, you pinpointed that uh, the problem in um, in this, uh, like, uh, different development of civil societies, that there is also civil society, the Kyrgyz-speaking population. So, uh, yeah, Adam um, mentioned that when I'm talking about Kyrgyz-speaking and Russian-speaking, it doesn't mean the, it's not the ethnic marker, but uh, rather it, it would be uh, urban and rural-based, uh, yeah, like, civil societies maybe. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, uh, the, the, now what we have is uh, like different, this, um, uh, let's say like very broadly speaking, two, um, uh, two like chambers, echo chambers. So, well, so the, the re religious oriented or conservative values oriented civil society on one hand, on the other it's, um, this uh, Bishkek based, let, let's say it's uh, mostly the, the Bishkek uh, oriented civil society. And uh, what was failed uh, in this development and in this like, dispersion of the values was uh, channeling the information uh, like uh, more or less like equally. Uh, th this was a big problem, uh, not only from the uh, from the role of the government, but from the role of uh, uh, people and civil societies and NGOs uh, and international organizations as well. Uh, so, uh, which highlighted the uh, Russian speaking, I, I'm saying lots of Russian speaking, uh, because I see that this is the huge problem and the, this is uh, yeah, the core of uh, this uh, like cleavage and polarized society. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, Nazima, is there anything else you want to bring in here? I mean, I thought you raised the, the, the Mahala question at the beginning.
maybe, maybe not. Um, okay, um, just if, if Nazima doesn't want to come back in and then for understandable um, reasons, uh, the um, one of the questions that we touched on very briefly earlier was around the role of religious groups and communities. Uh, I think that was in the Kyrgyz context. I wasn't sure anyone wants to add anything more on either, you know, so sort of particularly in Kyrgyzstan, but sort of who, who, who what, what, do you want to say a little bit more about the different types of religious groups and sort of how religiosity has developed in uh, in, in Kyrgyzstan and what, what that, how does that factor in? As I said, and as, as Nazima, I think, had said, yeah, no, there are overlaps between the priorities of religiously inspired and non religiously inspired conservative movements, but they don't, don't always overlap. Um, are there any, uh, are there anything you want to add on that at all? Uh, so religious groups and um, based on what recently seen uh, in regard to this like religious group is the those movements outside the uh, the groups which hello uh, I can't really no worries you're back you, you just froze uh, it. Oh. So, so sorry, so today my internet is uh, down. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so re about the religious groups, um, I was saying that uh, now they make distinction of uh, like religiosity or religious movements, those who are influenced uh, by, uh, by other than Hanafi school of thought. So this is how um, this like traditionalist organiz organizations, there are around uh, 20 organizations uh, who is now uh, cooperating with the president's office. Uh, so, and uh, they like uh, write uh, black and on the white that Hanafi, those outside the Hanafi is like a threat. Uh, that's, uh, that's also like in, uh, includes um, Tablighi Jamaat uh, influences, which is the strongest in Kyrgyzstan. Okay, excellent. All right. Yeah, so I would just uh, recommend the work uh, by Emil Nastradinov on, on this score. He's been doing very good research on this. Um, and uh, as a student of his work, uh, one of the conclusions that I come away with is that there's so much complexity uh, mm -hmm. in the religious landscape in Kyrgyzstan that it's very hard to identify what's traditional, what's not traditional. Um, and so he does a fantastic job of laying out that complexity um, from someone who's not only a scholar, but a participant in, 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 in these movements. Uh, so that's excellent work. I think the one thing that I would like to stress is a point that Gulzat brought up, and I think it's good for our understanding of religion in Central Asia broadly, is a lot of our understanding of religion is mediated through a formal institution, uh, which is these, these legacy muftiyats. The, the, I mean, the, they're, they're still present across Central Asia. Uh, and that uh, has an outsized role in how we understand what is conservative and what is not conservative, because they are, for whatever reason, um, in the position to opine on what is considered traditional or legitimate Islam and what is not. Uh, and, and so I think although the landscape is, is constantly shifting, there is one constant, and that is the power of these muftiyats, uh, these um, quasi-state, if not state authorities, in shaping the broader public discourse around religion. And we all have to be careful because even myself, I, find, I sometimes find myself adopting the language that the muftiyat uses when it's just far more complicated than the binaries that they're advancing. Brilliant, okay. Um... Zima, do you want to come in on this tool in a respect context or, uh, or, or is it on the previous Mahala question or? No worries. Okay, I completely understand um, with another one. Um, it's a difficult juggling act to the best of times. Um, just going back to one of the questions, there's, we've got a couple more questions in the chat and then I'll ask people to give their final closing remarks if that's okay. Um, one of the questions from Erkenbeck was uh, around what was been the impact of the pandemic on uh, sort of the narratives around rights, not only social economic, uh, but but more broadly on the on, on both traditional media and social media in Uzbekistan. Have, have we seen any impact of the uh, of the pandemic on on some of these wider narratives? Um, and my uh, 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 ask a specific question around the most recent uh, rep 
uprising, revolution, whatever we're calling the October events, uh, around um, uh, you know, a risk that future uprisings may have a religious character to, to them. Um, anyone want to come in on those? Or, and and why, don't, why don't people make any closing remarks that they want to make uh, as part of this uh, response? And then I will end up with uh, Dimitri uh, saying some closing remarks. So um, the the COVID nineteen pandemic showed um, uh, like the weakness of traditional media, so and decentralization of which uh, because it didn't have like uh, direct access and the information was distorted a lot. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, traditional uh, mass media, uh, but then on social media also. Um, uh, because of maybe no direct access to uh, like World Health, Health Organization, all this kind of uh, more solid organizations, the information was coming from like, different sources and lots of uh, fake news. So yeah, the pandemic showed um, the vulnerability of also uh, media, both traditional and social media, to uh, to yeah to, to the extent that uh, uh, content makers or, uh, or, or those uh, who is uh, spreading your medical uh, updates on medical news are not ready to, yeah, to compile and to present uh, reliable. Uh, so this is in terms of um, uh, medical news. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, that, that's interesting. It's just made me think, I mean, one of the, things we've seen in the West is how COVID related scepticism and uh, bid online, you know, everything through from sort of vaccine and, and lockdown scepticism through to QAnon have been bolstered by the fact that people have been in their own homes for a lot following stuff on social media and the role of certain health and COVID related narratives being a pathway into wider socially conservative nor uh, and, and uh, sometimes conspiracy norms is there an, have you did it was that part of the pathway just in terms of sort of plugging into sort of fake news narratives is there anything that was visible in a Kyrgyz context obviously we've seen the rise of you know Japan via social media but was there anything that that the pandemic itself became the pathway for that as we've seen in the states and to some extent in the UK because that was there anything Hello, sorry, so I, I, yeah, my internet today is so unstable, oh, yeah, so no, can you repeat you, the question? It was a bit of a ramble, but um, it was more about whether the pandemic created a pathway to certain types of conservative uh, social narratives because of oh, discussion yeah, yeah. about the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, like anti-vaccine and yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 lots of like, uh, yeah, conspirological news, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eric, do you want to come in at all? Uh, and and, and uh, are there any final comments you want to make those up before you before we go? Oh no, I can just wrap. I can uh, wrap up with a final comment, um, which touches on the question that you raised and Maya raises and Mira uh, Mira's question above about corruption and what's to be done. Um, at the end of the, th of the of these kinds of conversations, I think it's often we, we can often feel kind of unsettled and what what you know what, <laughs> what do you do? Uh, and I think Mira's question really gets to the heart of it in your conversation, Adam, about. Um, uh, kind of conspiracy theories with the vaccine uh, and, and COVID. Uh, there's, there's one community that I would point to um, in the absence of strong institutions um, uh, and, and the difficulty of building strong institutions. Uh, there's one community that can help expose corruption and can help expose conspiracy theories. Uh, and that has been very effective, uh, not only in Kyrgyzstan, but in Uzbekistan and in Kazakhstan, and, 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 that, and that's the press. Um, uh, the, the one safeguard that, uh, um, exists in Central Asia, and I would actually argue the safeguard that kept the United States from crashing against the rocks at the end of the Trump era uh, was the media. Um, and, and I think the logic here, and what's so encouraging, is that journalists, professional journalists, are motivated uh, not necessarily by money, but by but but by reputation and but by the the um, esprit de corps of being a journalist that is getting getting the truth out. Um, and so, what is to be done, Mira? I would I would argue uh, keep supporting the media, keep keep supporting institutions that can get the truth out. Uh, because you're absolutely right, the institutions neither in Kyrgyzstan nor in the United States are sufficiently strong to withstand on their own this onslaught of a authoritarian populism. 
absolutely agreed, which is why authoritarian populists go after the media with such regularity. Um, Nazina. Um, yes, I'm here, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh, no worries, so. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I have a comment um, regarding the previous issue of Mahalla. Um, actually, uh, in uh, Mahalla, uh, through Mahalla, the government um, conjuncts with uh, the religious community and to make it more peaceful, to make it um, um, not like uh, not radical. Um, and here is the cooperation between the religious community and Mahalla um, uh, through, um, for instance, Otens. Otens, it is uh, the female manifestation of Mullah. So, um, and they actually um, act as a reconciliation committee for reconciling um, um, the, the spouses um, and um, they are also, they play a role of um, in um, social activities, in hashars, um, they gather together women. So they are up to the female dimension, but they are very, very, very conservative. And they are actually uh, in guard of traditional values and they, um, declare it openly, so they are the manifestation of traditionalism through Mahalla. Um, but they try to, you know, to keep uh, the grip on also the religious manifestation of traditionalism. So this is how the government is going, is uh, tries to, um, you know, to keep the situation under control. And what was another question um, besides Mahalla? Uh, we were just asking. We touched on issues around religion and religiosity and also yeah. around and also online discourse um you know yeah. in relation to the pandemic being a touch uh, overlap into into other other more socially conservative narratives yeah in this regard i um completely agree with eric um it's too complicated um because um you, we have uh, more or less like one um, branch of Islam here in Uzbekistan that is dominant here. But, you know, um, the people are not very familiar with um, uh, the Arabian uh, or the Middle Eastern type of Islam. And um, they may romanticize that type of Islam, but they are not uh, deep into the uh, Central Asian roots of Islam. Um, and the very uh, authentic Central Asian type of Islam here in the modern Uzbekistan is not very popular. So this is kind of um, a mixture of Islam that is um, um, manifested through social media by uh, some people that are abroad, some by some religious bloggers, uh, by some religious bloggers that are here. Um, and you know, all this is very um, complicated, but at the same time, very simple. Uh, social media is actually um, doing the, the who game um, in general and creating um, this diverse um, uh, type of religiosity. Um, but again, if we speak about the religiosity, this does not necessarily mean that um, we speak about very radical Islam. But again, we don't have any research into this. Um, and we don't, we can't um, claim neither of uh, the arguments whether um, Islam in um, Central Asia is peaceful or not because we, we really lack any um, or um, we can um, ask question whether it is peaceful here and now and how it will be manifested in the future so these are the questions to ask in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Nazima. Okay, well, thank you so much for all for a very stimulating discussion. Um, before, and um, yeah, we've got a lot of, uh, that, yeah, we could pick away at these issues for, for many more hours to come, um, but uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there for today. Um, I want to just very briefly, uh, before we go, hand over to Dimitri to say a few final words on behalf of IWPR. Thank you, Adam. Um, I think that's, that's a true thing to say that uh, this was in fact, Indeed, 
a very incredible discussion. It was a great pleasure to listen to all of you. And I would like to extend my, my gratitude to everyone who joined the event today. And I would like to thank our panel of speakers, Zat uh, Bayeliva, by, by Dr. Eric Maglinci, and Isma Davletva, and special thanks to our facil facilitator today, Adam Hag. Um, you really gave us the tour through some issues, challenges that surround the current situation uh, with the growing influence of conservatively minded groups in Central Asia and how they affect the human rights uh, situation, how they affect uh, other issues. And I, I also enjoyed listening to some recommendations from the side of our speakers. They really enjoyed the suggestion that to combat at least some fake information, we have to invest and support the true media, which can tell people that the, what is going on and to counter the disinformation and the manipulation of opinion. That that was a fantastic thing, which, which really flows from this discussion of ours, from how these ideas, they, what, what, what are they consist, uh, what, what they consist of, and how do they evolve. This, this really stems out of that. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to the questions and answer sessions today, and it was great thing to, to read our chats today here, because there were so many questions, and the, the people got the answers to the questions that they, they wanted, and they were grateful for that, so we're happy for that as well. And it is uh, there, there were so many links uh, in the chat for you to check them out uh, and, and see to, to stay on par with the current academic scholar discussion of the issue at hand. Uh, we also had a question about the Russian translation of our event today, and uh, this really shows that we need to continue our work and uh, we please check what IWPR and what Foreign Policy Center are doing. Keep in touch through our websites, kabar.asia, iwpr.net, and fpc.org.uk, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And our discussion today would not be possible without the great help and support from our valued partner, Foreign Policy Center. Uh, we very much appreciate our partnership uh, and look forward to having more joint events with you. I sincerely hope that you too enjoyed our today's discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> Keep in touch. We will publish a highlight on our web website. So yeah, you, you, you can uh, check that as well. Thank you. Bye.